The interstate system involves several engineering marvels. The process of building these freeways across the diverse landscape of America, including swamps, mountains, deserts, and other challenging areas, proved to be one of the most impressive infrastructural accomplishments in U.S. history. Specifically, interstate highways that pass through mountainous areas brought countless challenges to planners and engineers because finding a way to pass such a large piece of roadway safely through an area with difficult terrain is no easy task. Interstate 70 in Colorado is known as one of the most impressive interstate routes, passing through the heart of the Rocky Mountains in an area that would serve an extremely important route for transportation across the state. So today I wanted to talk about all the different aspects that go into building a highway like this, including terrain, traffic, environmental challenges, weather, and how all of that came together to create what we know today as Interstate 70 in Colorado. Before we get into that though, make sure you do subscribe to the channel. We make geography content like this every week, so if you enjoy the content related to roads, cities, and geography, click the subscribe button below. Thank you! So Interstate 70 in Colorado, as I previously said, is one of the most unique and high-end highway projects in American history as far as engineering goes. Pushing a divided highway through small and sometimes almost non-existent valleys is an idea that would serve to be very difficult. I-70 in Glenwood Canyon is known to be the last part of the original interstate system to be finished. It was opened October 14, 1992, which would be 36 years after the first mile of interstate was paved. This involved countless years of planning how they could even fit the highway through the area, how it would affect traffic, and how they could mitigate environmental impact. It's hard to know where to even start with this highway, so I'll start by giving a quick overview of the highway's length from start to finish. So the portion we're talking about begins outside of Denver, and it begins with a steep incline into the foothills of the Rockies. Its first main city is Idaho Springs, a mining town that the highway passes directly past. Moving on, it continues at a very steady incline towards the top of the mountain range. It passes its next two cities with Georgetown and Silver Plume, and later on meeting its top height at the Eisenhower Tunnel. Now we'll get into this essential tunnel through the mountains later on. But for now, just know that this is the peak of the highway, nearly 6,000 feet higher than it was when it entered the mountains. Once it's through the tunnels, it begins its descent, passing through the Frisco and Silverthorne metropolitan area, a massive skiing area. West of there, it reaches Vail and slowly makes its way to one of the most difficult zones along its route, Glenwood Canyon. This begins around Ocero until Glenwood Springs, with a canyon filled with two elevated directions of traffic that are stacked nearly on top of each other for most of its length, with multiple tunnels as well. Glenwood Springs is then where I end my zone of interest, because this is where the most detail went into the highway's design. So now that you know what the highway is and where it goes, I wanted to go issue by issue, starting with the problems that are most visible and impactful, and going over everything that went into designing around them. So with that, we'll start with the biggest problem, which is the terrain. So when you talk about I-70 in Colorado, you think about the fact that it passes through massive mountains and goes higher than any other interstate in the country. There are two major zones in which I found this terrain to be the most impactful, the first of which would be the Eisenhower Tunnel. So the Eisenhower Tunnel is located at the Continental Divide, where the valley ended and there was no place left for the highway to sneak its way through. So this gave them the question, how would they push it through? In the current design, U.S. Highway 6 went over Loveland Pass to the south of the current tunnel, weaving its way along the side of a mountain before and after reaching the 11,991-foot max height. Some people put the idea of pushing the interstate along this route, as it was the only really viable option that wouldn't require a tunnel. But with the environmental impact and basically non-existent route for it to pass, it seemed like the only actual possibility would be building a massive 1.64-mile tunnel through the mountains. Not only would this be a very long tunnel, but two were actually required for each direction of traffic. This ended up costing $117 million to build, which equates to $741 million present day. Though 90% of this was paid for by the federal government, the price tag was still difficult to justify. This tunnel wasn't simple to design either. They had to overcome geological challenges. The region was mainly composed of hard granite and nice rock, two very hard rocks, this made drilling and blasting very difficult, as the rock could damage equipment or slow down the process at the very least. Specialized drills were required because of these highly resistant rocks. Water infiltration also made the engineering process daunting. Planners had to design it in a way that would stop water from seeping into the tunnel from nearby rock layers. 
With the construction team considering this risk and developing a system for diverting groundwater and keeping it waterproof. There were many other challenges, including the difficulty of transporting these large construction vehicles to such an area, but the tunnels were built using 380,000 cubic yards of concrete. Due to biohazard risks, some trucks were still forced to take US-6 over Loveland Pass, which served to be difficult for often very large semis. But there is an ongoing study to study the feasibility of allowing these hazardous trucks through the tunnel. Moving on from that, the next major zone of difficulty came in Glenwood Canyon, a 14.5 mile stretch in the west part of the state. This is a very interesting one, because though it wasn't anywhere near the peak of the largest mountains in the state, it proved to be the most challenging stretch to push a divided highway through. Mainly, it was just too thin. You could barely fit one road through, like US-6 that was there beforehand and was one of the most dangerous stretches of highway in Colorado. How would you fit a much wider four-lane interstate along the route? Well, I'll tell you how. You create the most engineeringly complex stretch of highway in America. So let's start with their first plan. Instead of having to flatten a wide area for the two directions of traffic, they built them basically on top of each other so they could blend into the cliff better. The westbound roadway would be 35 feet wide and would be elevated from the eastbound roadway. But there were zones where even this wasn't possible. So five different tunnels and four bridges were constructed along the route. Most notably at Hanging Lake, an area with a dam that couldn't be disturbed. Now there's a lot more that went into Glenwood Canyon. But that leads us to our second challenge, environmental impact. So Glenwood Canyon was an extremely ecologically sensitive area. These monster freeways were controversial enough, but it was built through the White River National Forest, where herds of elk, deer, bighorn sheep, and other species make their home. The elevated roadway was then meant to give wildlife easy opportunities to move freely across the canyon without worrying about traffic. Though no studies were conducted before or after construction, it's been suggested by biologists that the effects were minimal, if any, a huge win for the engineers. Another major problem was recreation. Glenwood Canyon was popular for tourism, including fishing, picnicking, camping, and more. The former roadway saw no turnoffs or recreationally focused design, which resulted in trash along the road and river with parked cars all over. This was a major focus of the planning process, but with significant public involvement, ideas were thought up. Four rest stops were fit into the design, a full bike path along the entire route was built, with it moving on the edge of the highway, and several boat launches were created. According to the Federal Highway Administration, many local residents and frequent visitors said the canyon was actually safer, cleaner, and more accessible than it was before the highway was upgraded to an interstate. Glenwood Canyon was a massive success, but there are more problems. Throughout the entire route, environmental concerns were at the forefront of the planning process. There were many areas, Glenwood Canyon included, that were extremely prone to rock slides and even flooding. The highway has been closed countless times, including March 2024 and August 2022. It's so difficult to design it in a way that can completely avoid this. And in the situation that it happens, while fully at work, it can cost around $1 million every hour it's closed. This has been a serious weakness of the highway, since its closure can be detrimental to the state's economy. Which leads me to my next problem, traffic. I-70 is not only the most treacherous stretch of interstate, but it's also near the top in overall importance. It serves as the only limited access route through the Colorado Rockies, being a major connector for that long-distance freight travel. But it's also crucial for local traffic, as it connects mountain communities with resort towns like Vail needing the highway for tourism's sake. It also connects Denver to Grand Junction, two large cities. This, going along with the steep terrain and unupgradable four-lane design in most areas, has resulted in a highly congested, very dangerous stretch of highway. There are frequent accidents, and the highway can get completely jammed up especially on weekends and holidays due to the major ski resorts in towns like Vail, Avon, and Silverthorne. What if they needed to do construction work or clean up an accident? The roadway is extremely fragile, and it makes it so difficult to do this. This was basically impossible to design for, and they were forced to simply count their losses and hope the design would hold up. And it hasn't fully when it comes to traffic. With it being especially bad in the winter, which brings us to our next concern, which is weather. Now, due to the skiing industry, the winter months actually see the highest traffic levels. This is a problem because obviously it is. We're talking about a highway that gets to over 11,000 feet above sea level, 
There are severe winter storms that can close up the highway or at least make it very dangerous. It can cause icy conditions and jam up thousands of drivers in the snowy, hazardous conditions, particularly at the Eisenhower Tunnel and Vail Pass. In these areas, snow can fall unexpectedly and cause massive concerns, including avalanches if conditions are right. There's also fog, especially in Glenwood Canyon, that can make things even more difficult than snow. Finally, this weather has made the idea of a weathering roadway in the already very fragile stretch. Freeze-thaw conditions, much like you see in northern states, become a concern for the highway. Snow plows and salt also have a negative long-term impact on the roadway surface that can't be ignored. And in areas with steep grades, trucks would put extra stress on the roadway with their braking to go downhill and extra force to go uphill. Engineers had to plan it to minimize the effects of this, making the process more lengthy and expensive. Even with these concerns, the interstate was built and serves as probably the most impressive stretch of highway in the country. Though this only covers the problems, and I could have spent even more time going over other problems, including opposition and concerns over disruption of local communities, and I also could have talked about other solutions engineers found, but this is the best I can do. I cited my sources in the description below, so hopefully you believe me on how amazing Interstate 70 really is. Thanks for watching.